That's a cold bug. That's a cold bug. Well, that's definitely a cold bug. So it seems like for the last decade, every hunter in the woods has been obsessed with the term cold buck. But is this backed up by science? Can you really improve antler genetics by shooting cold bucks? That's what we're digging into in today's video, and the answer may surprise you. Stay tuned. So before we get too deep into the video, it probably is worth spending a little more time talking about the definition of a cold buck. To me, I would call that any buck with an inferior antler genetic, but if you talk to some more technical people like the folks at the National Deer Association, they would tell you it was a deer with a less than desirable rack. And since we like these big, symmetrical, long tined bucks, that means a cold buck can be a lot of different things. It could be a buck without eye guard, a buck with one normal side and then a spike on the other or a variety of other different antler configurations. But talking about the antler configurations does bring up one of the first issues with cull bucks. It can mean something different to everyone. You can just see a deer with a weird rack on your trail camera and decide, you know what? To me, that's a cull buck. I don't want that buck breeding does. I don't want those kind of antler genetics in my pool breeding my entire deer herd. So it's a cull buck now. And another big problem about cull bucks is you see a lot of folks using the term cull buck as the stamp of approval to shoot a younger age class deer that they normally wouldn't shoot. And if you want to shoot a young deer, that's fine. I don't care what anybody shoots, but using the term cull buck to justify it because you're not proud of it doesn't really make it a cull buck. The gold standard for a white tail buck has always and probably will always be the same. A huge framed, long tined, wide buck. And if you're talking about a typical something with symmetry, if you want more of those kind of bucks roaming the woods, shouldn't we be shooting these small frame deer with no eye guards, deer that'll have spike on one side so that those bigger bucks have more availability to breed more does? Maybe not, maybe so, but let's dig into a scientific study that might change your mind. So this scientific study takes place back in 2006 in the beginning and stretches all the way to 2015. So the researchers in this study were some of the most respected whitetail biologists in the entire country. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these names on some of the biggest podcasts in the hunting industry. Names like Donnie Drager, like Dr. Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State University. Dr. Charlie DeYoung, PhD student Masa Onishi, please forgive me if I didn't pronounce that name correctly. Dr. Randy DeYoung of Texas A&M Kingsville. And like I said, you guys may be familiar with a lot of these folks on this list because they are well respected throughout the whitetail biology space. And one of the reasons they wanted to do this study initially was Donnie Drager had tried culling bucks on this ranch that they're going to conduct the research on for the last wide amount of years and wanted some scientific research to prove if culling was having any effect on the antler potential of the bucks within the herd. And as you know, with research, you have to do it long term and it has to be done in a in a fairly controlled environment, which is hard to do in a free range whitetail herd. So they did their best with the resources they had and this is kind of how the study was set up so this study takes place at the comanche ranch in texas so they initially split the ranch into three different areas with different levels of culling implemented in each individual area the first area was an intensive culling area that was about 3500 acres the second was a moderate treatment area that was about 18,000 acres and lastly, there was a no culling area that was about 5,000 acres. And in the realm of scientific research, this would be the control. This is the benchmark to see if all of the culling is going to have any impact on creating bigger bucks in the future. So each fall from 2006 to 2015, they used net guns from helicopters to, to capture and tag bucks in all three of the treatment areas. And please keep in mind, this is Southwest Texas brush country. It's not like the big woods of Pennsylvania or something like that. You can actually see these deer from a helicopter fairly well. So there was four things that they did to each individual buck once they captured it. They estimated the age based on tooth wear. They collected a DNA sample. They measured the antlers for score and inserted a micro trip pit tag in the ear of the deer. Let's briefly talk about the culling criteria or what was going to make each area intensive, moderate, or no culling at all. For the intensive area, any yearling with less than six points was culled. 
two and a half year olds with less than eight points were cold. Three and a half to four and a half year olds with less than nine points were cold. And bucks that were five and a half and didn't score over 145 inches Boone and Crockett were also cold. In the moderate area, three and a half to four and a half year old bucks with less than nine points were all cold. And all bucks that were five and a half years old or older and less than 145 inches Boone and Crockett were also cold. And talking about the controlled area, there was no culling at all. All bucks captured, they just tagged and aged and measured and then released. One of the crazy things about this is when you hear cold, you're like, what do you mean by that? You mean that bucks that weren't big enough, they let hunters go out and shoot them and take them home? No, it's actually a little more sad than that. For seven years in the intensive and the moderate culling areas, if they didn't meet the respective culling criteria, these bucks, they were sacrificed under scientific research permits that were issued by the state of Texas. Stop it! And I kind of looked into the article a little more to see if those deer were donated at least or kind of what happened to them. And I couldn't find anything specific. I would hope that they went to a program like Hunters for the Hungry or something like that since so many of them are getting cold on this big ranch. But uh, that is that wasn't determined by my research or maybe I just missed it in the article. I'm, I'm not sure. Any bucks that were captured and did meet the culling criteria were released. In all, over this period of nine years, 4,264 bucks were captured, and of those over 4,000, 2,503 were individual bucks that were included in the study. Of those 2,500 bucks, 1,333 of them were culled. So since 1,333 bucks had to lose their lives for us to see this research, when I was reading through this, I was just praying to God that there was some sort of logical conclusion or something meaningful that came out of this research since a lot of Texas whitetails had to be more or less sacrificed for us to get this information. So let's dig into some of the results and see if the moderate culling, the intensive culling, or the no culling had any effect in the antler potential of offspring and the antler quality of, of the herd as a whole. So let's start off with the intensive treatment area and see what the results were. So the big headline result of the intensive culling area was a complete crash of the buck population. You know, when you're culling deer that are a year and a half years old and if they don't have six points or more, most of those deer are going to be cold. This was probably fairly predictable and I think the biologists knew that, um, but they needed to practice it to see what would happen. They cited that each year, 85 to 100% of the bucks that were captured were cold, which is a virtually all of the bucks didn't meet the culling criteria. And what was crazy about this is through DNA testing, they realized that a lot of the bucks they were culling, their fathers were not cold bucks. The older age class deer were not cold bucks, even though the young ones were considered that in an intensive culling area. You often hear people talking about the golden ratio of, of, of bucks to does. And I think most biologists would tell you that's a one to one ratio. The Comanche Ranch had a one to one buck ratio before they implemented the intensive culling in this area. And at the end of the nine years, that ratio had changed from one buck to six does. And since they were taking so many of those younger age class deer out of the herd, there were some very large antlered bucks left in the intensive culling area. There wasn't enough of them to reproduce with all the does in the area, which essentially just caused a buck population crash. So let's move on to the moderate culling treatment area and talk about some of the results of the study. So one of the immediate things that I liked about the moderate research area was they didn't cull any bucks that were a year and a half and two and a half. You know, I think one of the issues you see a lot of times with people that like to shoot cull bucks is any forky or spike, you know, once a spike, always a spike, you hear things like that, or you see two year olds that might just be a six point and they get shot because people think, oh, well, you know, he'll always be a six point or he'll never mature to have a better rack. Well, this area was not targeting any of those bucks. So right out of the gate, some of the negative effects that we saw with the intense culling area, those were not present in the moderate culling area. So you didn't see 
a crash of the buck population um, and the buck to doe ratio and you didn't see a lot of late born fawns because there were not enough bucks to breed those does so that's already an improvement from the intense culling area there was no no evidence of successful genetic change so the bucks by taking out those weaker bucks in the three and four and five year old age classes they didn't see a big jump in antler potential of the offspring you would think the number of coal bucks would shrink every year the more culling that you're doing but one of the things the researchers notice with not only the intensive area but the moderate area as well is the number of bucks that they were having to cull every single year it never declined i believe there's another quote from donnie here that says if you claim that culling is working for you but you don't have a control area for comparison you have a hollow statement that's just your guess as to what is causing the improvements you've seen the average boone and crockett score of bucks in the moderate culling area was pretty much the same at the end of the seven year culling and the nine year experiment. And to speak a little bit about the control area, it was exactly the same. You would expect in the intensive and the moderate culling areas, the average score of those bucks going up and up and up because they're taking out the weaker ones and leaving the bigger racked bucks and bigger sco better scoring bucks to breed those does. And it virtually had no effect in the control, the intense or the moderate areas, no effect at all. And it's crazy to me that the antler quality stayed exactly the same from areas that had none of the culling, none of the high-tech helicopter captures. They had all the same tagging and tracking features, but the score didn't go up on either one of the three different areas, which is just, just nuts to me. I, I would not suspect that based on my own experience. So we talked about the results of all three of the different culling criteria and areas. Let's talk a little bit more about why it didn't work, but let's talk a little bit about the DNA analysis that Masa Onishi and Dr. Randy DeYoung did on the bucks to determine why this culling and the different levels of it didn't work. So through DNA analysis, they were able to connect 963 buck fathers to their offspring and build these really intricate family trees, building a family tree just like you would if you were on Ancestry.com or something like that. So by studying these family connections in combination with known antler measurements for each buck in the family tree, some across multiple years, the team established what they called a breeding value. And the breeding value is unique to each individual buck. So this might get a little complicated on how they calculated the breeding value. So I'm going to read it absolutely verbatim here so I don't mess this up and you guys know exactly how they came up with this number. So a breeding value is the following. A buck's genetic value based on the antler quality of its offspring relative to the age for the population. So a buck that produced offspring with above average antlers for the population earned a higher breeding value and vice versa. You would think if your dad was LeBron James, the likelihood of you being 6'5 is pretty dang good. But what they found out is not every buck with LeBron James genetics is going to be LeBron James. Let's talk a little more about it. So with culling, you should take all the bucks with low breeding values and remove them. That way there are more higher breeding value bucks available to mate does and then eventually produce fawns. More specifically, buck fawns for this study. But through these family trees, they came up to what the biologists could only explain as a brick wall. So out of the 2,600 some bucks that were tested, the buck with the highest breeding value, which means the buck that was going to produce the biggest antlered offspring, only scored 123 inches. And that was 123 inches at six and a half years old. So you think, man, that 120 incher that is mature, I shoot that buck because he didn't need to be breeding does. But what they found was this buck in the study produced the biggest antlered offspring, which is kind of like, it's, it's nuts to me. They found through scientific research of some of the most respected biologists that culling doesn't work. It scientifically doesn't work. And I think one of the best examples of this is this 123 inch buck that produced the biggest antlered offspring and throughout all of the bucks that were analyzed and tested and plotted on the family tree. This is just nuts to me. Some other factors that I quickly wanted to talk about before we wrap this video up is one, if we're culling bucks, the only criteria we're using to, to cull a buck is its antlers. 
These researchers already disproved that a rack is a shallow way of measuring a buck's breeding value. But another thing to consider is the doe. 50% of the genetics of that buck is going to come from the doe. And her genetics are going to affect how big of a rack that 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 buck fawn can grow. If that doe's father had a huge rack, that's going to have some sort of an effect on how big of a rack that offspring can can produce. And one thing that we know is you'll never know what kind of breeding value that the doe has. So, and we can't cull does. So you're leaving 50% of the conversation off the table, right off the top. Another factor that I quickly wanted to talk about is injuries. We've all seen a buck that's injured and we know that injuries can affect a buck's rack from year to year. I think we've all seen or heard of somebody shooting a buck that was maybe hit by a car and one side grows normal the next year and then he has a funky side on the other. So let's talk about some of my experiences with coal bucks or quote unquote coal bucks. In 2021, I shot a super weird funky, non-typical eight point. You guys might be thinking, okay, it's just an eight point. How could it be that non-typical? Well, I'll show you. This deer was seven and a half years old, uh, which was confirmed by my taxidermist when he pulled the jaw and analyzed it. And I believe the deer had been hit by a car on his right side the year before. You can see it in the video of the hunt when he's walking in, there seems to be a big like hematoma or big mass uh, right below his, right next to his back right hip. And he was walking weird hunched up he was just looked like he was injured and i didn't shoot this buck because i thought oh he's a cold buck you know he's been hit by a car and he's injured i shot this deer because he was a mature animal and he was something that i would be happy to put my tag on was this buck considered a cold buck his entire life i have no idea i had no previous history with him so it's pretty much impossible to determine what his rack looked like in previous years. A lot of his offspring is gonna be determined by the genetics of the doe that he chose to mate with. So this is just a good example of a buck that a lot of people would consider a cull buck and one that I just wouldn't. If you wanna shoot a mature animal that has a funky rack, go ahead. But that's just a mature trophy deer in my mind. That's not a cull deer. You don't have to justify shooting something a little bit smaller that was mature by calling it a cull deer. That's really just a trophy. And trophies aren't always measured in inches. To me, maturity is a trophy. The science doesn't support the claim that taking a less than desirable buck out of the herd has produced bigger antlered offspring. And I know that might be a shame to a lot of people, but that's just the science. I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I, I do know how to read a, an article and disseminate the information. And that's just what it says. And you might be thinking, well, what can we do about this? What can we take away if we're no longer going to cull deer and we have in the past, what can we take away from this? I think one of the things that I would recommend to most people is start shooting for age and not for score. You know, if you want to shoot a three and a half year old that scores 170 or something, go for it. I'm not telling you what to do, but my recommendation would be to start shooting deer for age. Any deer that has eluded humans for four, five, six, seven, eight years, that is a trophy. I don't care what kind of antlers are sitting on top of his head. I've got so many deer on the wall that most would be considered a coal buck to some people, but to me, we're six and a half or seven years old. And to me, that's a trophy. So if we can change the conversation of what is a trophy, and maturity becomes the trophy and not score, then I think we'll have a lot less people trying to slap a coal buck tag on something that they're not happy with. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys enjoyed the science. Big thank you to all the researchers in this project and the National Deer Association for publishing this article. We appreciate it. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe and we'll catch you guys in the next one.